Welcome to Cincy Reformed. I'm Pastor Brandon, joined with Pastor Zach. We're co pastors at Westside Reformed Church, a URC congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio. Today we want to talk about um, manuscript differences. Now, um, a lot of people have been clued into this because perhaps you're with somebody and you have different translation of the Bible. So maybe one person has like the New King James and another person has like an ESV. And, and there might be some verses where the ESV might say, and um, he uh, committed himself to prayer, whereas the New King James might say prayer and fasting. Well, why did the New King James say prayer and fasting and the ESV just say prayer? And then even as you're reading in the Gospels, uh, for example, at the ending of Mark, you'll notice there's usually a note that says the earliest manuscripts do not contain the ending of Mark. And so, you know, as, as we're reading our Bible, sometimes we're kind of clued in to a debate that's happening within the manuscripts. Uh, that as we have so many manuscripts, I think the last I, I looked, we had like 5,500 manuscripts of the New Testament alone. So there's a lot of manu manuscripts out there, which is a good thing. It's good that we have so many manuscripts, and even, I mean, it's a lot more since um, even uh, the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, we didn't have as many, and we have so much more today, you know, with uh, finding of um, all of these uh, various artifacts and uh, different uh, fragments and papyri and so on and so forth. So it's good that we have these, but sometimes there's debates within the manuscripts. But I, I do want to reiterate that by no means does this mean that we somehow don't trust our Bibles. Like, we have the utmost uh, confidence in our Bibles. We can hold our Bibles and say, this is the Word of God, and we can stake our lives on, on the Bible. Uh, but, Zach, maybe you can kind of help us to think through. You know, we trust sure. our Bibles completely, but yet we're kind of clued in, as we're even doing a cursory reading of our Bibles, that there is some debate of the manuscripts behind it. Right, yeah. And maybe to clarify right here at the outset that when we're talking about differences in the manuscripts, we're not talking about differences in translation per se. So just to maybe make sure that's clear, because sometimes you're going to notice a difference in translation and the, the, the different translations might be referring to the same exact Greek text behind it. Okay. And, but it's just, maybe there's a different translation philosophy at work that kind of gives a different reading. But what we're talking about here is a difference in the underlying Greek texts. Like, for example, what Brandon mentioned of giving oneself to prayer or giving oneself to prayer and fasting. That's not just some mere difference in translation. That's the underlying Greek text. And that's just to clarify to make sure that we, we're on the same page as to what we're talking about. Uh, one of the things that uh, as we begin to think about this that I think is important to say in terms of what Brandon just said about having great confidence in our Bibles, that's in, in what we have in terms of our translations, and even for pastors in terms of their use of Greek and Hebrew, is that, and I see this all the time in, in my work for sermons, I know Brandon does this too, that the underlying Greek and Hebrew very rarely makes a whole lot of difference. I don't find that the textual differences between one um, one manuscript family and another or different readings, I feel like that very rarely does that have much of an impact on the meaning of the, of the text itself that I'm preaching. My use of Greek and Hebrew is very rarely trying to engage with the differences between manuscripts really just slows me down as I'm preparing a sermon and thinking very deeply about a text. It forces me to ask certain questions about why the English might be translated one way or the other. And so I think this rarely comes into play as far as a really meaningful thing on a text's uh, interpretation. Uh, the vast majority, um, and scholars note this, that 99% of our differences in manuscripts, 99% of the differences, it's just things like spelling, word order, or some other very minor, minor thing. Like a, a scribe just missed a letter here, and that becomes a difference. And that's the vast majority, or maybe two words got flipped around. The vast majority of what you see in terms of differences 
within underlying Greek manuscripts. Or one scholar or one scribe might say Church of God or mm -hmm. Church of Christ. Yep. I mean, you're really not going to change the meaning per exactly. se too much there. Exactly right. Here's a really helpful quote from um, Kostenberger and Kruger in their book, The Heresy of Orthodoxy. The New Testament is different from most other ancient texts in a fundamental way. The wealth of manuscript evidence at our disposal, both in quantity and date, gives us good reasons to think that the original text has not been lost, but has been preserved in the manuscript tradition as a whole. Given the fact that the vast number of textual variants is insignificant, and given that our text-critical methodology can tell which significant readings are original and which are secondary, we can have confidence that the text we possess is, in essence, the text that was written in the first century." End quote. So Brandon, maybe um, you can start introducing us to some of the ways that we might think of discerning between uh, manuscripts that are uh, more or less helpful and a reading that is better or not so good. Yeah, you know, I like what Kostenberger and Kruger say here, and you know, we have so many um, manuscripts that we can actually de we can actually detect deviations, right? Because we have so many that uh, we we can detect when when something's a bit off. But yeah, they, they talk about uh, the text critical uh, method, and uh, yeah, there is a kind of a, a whole a whole field of study called textual criticism, where people look at all of the various manuscripts. And you know, try to find out you know what is you know what was the original what was the original uh, writing and, and uh, what did the original autographs say? The autographs are those original writings from the apostles from the from the biblical authors themselves, and manuscripts are then copies of those autographs. So as we're looking at the manuscript, we're trying to figure out well, what was the autograph? What did the autograph have? What did the original have? And um, text critic um, scholars will typically do, um, will typically consider three things when they're looking and they're comparing uh, different readings. So for example, if uh, one manuscript says Church of God and the other one says Church of Christ, and you're trying to figure out which one was original, you would first look at the, the manuscript evidence and you would say, well, um, what are the manuscripts that contain uh, Church of God and one of the manuscripts that contain Church of Christ because there's different uh, manuscript families and some are more faithful th than others. Uh, for example, we have a, a, a Byzantine manuscript tradition, there's a Western um, uh, manuscript tradition, and there's an Alexandrian manuscript tradition. The Alexandrian is really one of the best ones. So uh, if you have an early date Alexandria manuscript that's um, gives you a reading, that, that would be weighed very heavily because you have a good quality manuscript with an early, early date on it, and you would weigh that heavy. Uh, they would also look internally too. So uh, exa for, for example, if you're weighing, should it be uh, render Church of God or render Church of Christ, uh, you might ask, how does the author typically translate? You know, does Paul typically say Church of Christ or does Paul typically say Church of God. You would do kind of an, an internal look at the author himself and say, well, what's more consistent with the author here? Another look they would do is maybe a scribal look, because a lot of these manuscripts, if you've ever looked at one of the original manuscripts, a lot of times they're written in all caps, and they're written very scrunched together, like they, they wanted to get as much writing on the piece of papyri as they could, so there's very little spaces at times. And when you're writing in all caps with very little spaces, it's very easy for a scribe to maybe miss a word. And so maybe you would look at, at a word or look at a sentence on the manuscript and say, well, is it easy here for a scribe to maybe gloss over a word? Um, I was looking at one manuscript and when I was in seminary, and um, there were two words side by side, looked almost the same. I mean, they were different words, but they looked almost identical. And in some of the manuscripts, one of the words was missing. 
and you could you could see why why that might be the case where the scribe's eyes glanced over the word or one of the words because they look so similar um, as you're as you're translating. So a text uh, a textual critic scholar is going to look externally at the at the at the manuscript and the manuscript evidence and they're going to look internally as well at what is consistent with the author um, do we see a place where it would have been very easy for a scribe to to make a mistake and then from that maybe deduce what is the most probable reading but again going back most of these scribal debates or manuscript debates are spelling or word order they're mixing words around perhaps maybe there's like a word missing or something like that but they're they're very very, very, very minor. And it's really only maybe 1% is anything major or anything big, but even those big ones are not um, insurmountable. So for example, there is in, in recent years, there's been a debate over 2 Peter 3.10. 2 Peter 3.10 is a text talking about um, in the end when Christ comes back, and it talks about judgment, it talks about this world order going away and a new heavens and a new earth being established. It's talking about that. And in the context of judgment, um, most of our, our uh, Bibles, our English Bibles, say that in that day, in the day of the Lord, our works will be exposed or will be laid bare. Well, some of the newer translations of the Greek text are now translating it will not be laid bare. So they're inserting a not there. So will they be laid bare or will they not be laid bare? And um, that might seem significant, but again, it would just carry different nuances. So for example, if the text says that our works will be laid bare or everything will be exposed, it, it's, it's, it's teaching the point that at Judgment Day, there's no secrets. At Judgment Day, everything's known, all of our works, all of our deeds laid bare and, um, and wickedness is, is seen. But if the text is supposed to say not laid bare, well, then we would have a different nuance there where we would perhaps say something like um, all of the sinfulness is not going to be is not going to be exposed. It's not going to be remembered. It's not going to be anything that carries on. All that wicked stuff is just going to go away. So it would carry a different nuance there, and it might change the way I preach that text depending on what nuance I give. But even even there, it's not anything major. And, and, and uh, again, at the end of the day, we, we trust our Bibles, but we do realize that there ha have been some debates, for example, the, 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 the ending of Mark, uh, there's a section in the Gospel of John, and there's a few uh, debates here or there about a word or a spelling or a word order or something. And you know these debates are important, and that's why we have people who do text criticism and all of these great things. But at the end of the day, they in no way destroy confidence in Scripture um, as, as our foundation. And, uh, the, and it's inerrant, it's infallible, it's sufficient, it's authoritative. I mean, all these great things that we believe about the Bible are not undone in any way by these scribal differences and, and, and debates that happen. Yeah, I think that with the examples that you just used right there and mentioned right there, as I think about as a pastor preaching these texts, I think you're right that there might be a, a, a slight different emphasis you might give in a sermon depending on for example that reading from second peter 3 verse 10 but the overall sermon itself because it's not based upon one phrase it's based on a series of verses together mm -hmm. it's really not going to change your overall thesis it's not going to change mm -hmm. the overall thrust of your sermon and it's definitely not going to affect your doctrinal theology I mean, the kind of differences that exist out there, whether the ending of Mark is original or whether that part in John's Gospel, that section in, uh, I think it's John 8, is original or not, these things are not affecting your overall belief about Christianity. These are simply some texts that are interesting, and if they're you know, authentic, it's helpful, and you know, read that. Even if it's not, it can still be helpful, mm -hmm. but it might just not be Scripture. But the point being that on a very practical level, it does not affect what we believe for salvation, does not affect what we do as Christians that, that obey and bring glory and honor to God. Mm -hmm. It's just that we humbly recognize that in our Christian pilgrimage that we are not in glory and that we humble ourselves, we strive forward in the best possible way we can, we trust with confidence that God has given us a sufficient word, 
and um, we commit ourselves to that. And I like what you said there. Like, it's not going to destroy Christianity, right? And uh, it's a good reminder that we shouldn't be scared because I've seen, you know, w- with debates with uh, atheists or very, you know, uh, people who are arguing against Christianity, sometimes they'll bring this up and say, well, look at all this debate. You don't even know what the Bible says. And they're, they're really trying to, to throw out smoke and mirrors. Uh, but don't be scared. Like, no, we do know what the Bible says. These differences in the manuscripts, while there might be in, in the thousands of differences between the manuscripts, that they're minor, they're spelling, they're word order. It's not changing Christ or Christianity or the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. It's not going to uh, re, re, uh, rewrite our faith by any means. So, yeah, don't be scared by by various scribal differences or misspellings or whatever it is. Don't be scared about that. And if somebody levies that at you, they just don't really know what they're talking about. And they've not actually looked into the, the text criticism themselves and um, the various manuscript traditions. So We hope this has been helpful for you. This is the uh, Sincere Reform Podcast. i um, here with my uh, co-pastor Brandon Burks and Zach Wise. Hope you join us again next week. Remember that our uh, podcast is sponsored by Westside Reform Church. And uh, we hope to see you some Sunday morning. Check us out, sincereformed.org and westsidereformed.org. Until next time, bye-bye.